Good morning, and welcome to the MA lecture on teaching and learning. I'm Beth Burrows, and it is my privilege to introduce a talented scholar and advocate in the educational mathematics community who I am proud to have known these last dozen years, Dr. Yvonne Lai. Dr. Lai is a mathematician who began her career studying hyperbolic geometry and geometric group theory. And she brings this perspective and expertise to her research as an educational mathematician, where she works in mathematical knowledge for teaching, equitable instruction, and practices of proof and reasoning. Dr. Lai is the Milton E. Moore Associate Professor in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She is chair of the MAA's Committee on the Mathematical Education of Teachers and the founding chair of the MAA's Special Interest Group on Mathematical Knowledge for Teaching, or Sigma MKT. Over the years, I have been continually impressed by her bold vision and her actions on behalf of prospective and practicing teachers and on behalf of those of us who specialize in mathematics education. I think you'll be impressed by her bold vision too in her talk today, Why to Build Bridges in Mathematics Education. She has set aside time at the end of her talk for conversation and questions. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Yvonne Lai. All right, well first, thank you to the organizers of the joint math meetings uh, and to the Project Next for the invitation and of course to all of you for coming here today to hear about why to build bridges in math education. Why build bridges when it's easier to burn it all down? These days it seems like there's more reward for a savvy put down of something that you don't agree with than it is to try to find reconciliation and to reach across and to listen, learn, and include. Before getting more into how and why to build bridges, I just want to say a little bit about the perspective that I come from. So as, um, as Beth said, my dissertation is in geometric group theory. Um, and I loved the years that I was able to spend turning coffee into theorems, and sometimes coffee uh, coffee cups into donuts and back. Um, but then, I, after this, I had a transition into math education research, which is where my heart is. And now I'm a tenure, and now I'm an associate professor at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and I work in a math department. Um, and I work in a math department as a math education researcher. And let me tell you, there is no place than a math department that I would rather be. And I'm fortunate that I'm in a math department that values and respects and solicits math education. Um, I believe that math education does have a place in math departments uh, and in the mathematical community. So the bridges that I wanna talk about today are between mathematicians and math educators, and maybe especially mathematics education researchers. And by mathematics, I mean anybody who identifies themselves that way through their professional work. Maybe you prove theorems, maybe you make models, maybe you model social, like physical or social phenomena. Whatever that means, you're a you might identify yourself as a mathematician. And by math education researcher, I also mean somebody who identifies that way because of their professional work. Maybe you think about teaching and learning. Maybe you investigate the successes and challenges of implementing programs. Maybe you're, maybe you're interested in what are the environments that can cultivate success for underrepresented groups. And here's my main argument that finding ways to listen, learn, and include is vital to the functioning of math departments and the future of mathematics. 
So how to make this argument? Well, I'm gonna do it in a couple of different claims. And my first claim is that we build bridges because it's who we are as a community and also who we need to be. And part of the reason why I can say this is even from mathematics. So you might recognize from these pictures here, um, a picture on perspectives and also a picture of hyperbolic geometry. And Bill Thurston is known for how he was able to build bridges across analysis, across geometry, across topology. And he was able to have this kind of vision because of the way that he built bridges among different disciplines. And we, as a math community, can also build bridges between mathematics and math education. And to show you this by existence, let's go through three examples. The first example is going to take place in Göttingen in the late 1800s to early 1900s. What do these pictures have in common? Or maybe the question is, who do these pictures have in common? And the answer is Felix Klein. So Felix Klein has a legacy in mathematics. He also has a legacy in mathematics education. And his legacy is through bridge building. In his work to improve math education, he worked with mathematicians and school teachers and engineers. And it's due to Klein that we have this emphasis on functions in our curriculum today. He was the first one that said, you know what, functions are important to the world, they're important, and so they're important to education, and we need to find a way to get it in there, but the only way to do that properly is to actually talk with people who use functions and talk with the people who understand what it is to teach children. In any field, mathematics included and mathematics education, naming problems and seeing problems is one of the major contributions that we can make. And he named a problem called the double discontinuity. In 1908, he named this problem. And this quote of double discontinuity was actually used in a 2012 publication, The Mathematical Education of Teachers Too. Um, and what he's talking about is that when teaching teachers, especially secondary teachers, we have to be mindful of the fact that secondary teachers might come in from high school to university and feel this discontinuity in their experiences of what teaching and learning and mathematics is like. And then, when, as they go from being an undergraduate student into the field as a high school math teacher, there's again this discontinuity of what did, what did anything I have to do in university have anything to do with mathematics teaching practice at the secondary level? So whatever truth you might read into that quote in the MET2 document, if you look at the original paragraph where this comes from, there's even more truth. Because what he's saying is that there's not only a discontinuity in the mathematical practice, but also a discontinuity in the pedagogical practice. And so part of building the continuities between school and university includes mathematical practice and teaching practice. And it might be through the structures and the intuitions. It might be through the approaches to the concepts and student conceptions. But he argued for this in 1908. I bring out Klein's example because his capacity to forge alliances among mathematicians and school teachers and engineers showed grace and curiosity in the face of conflict. What do I mean by this? Here's a logo of the German Association of Engineers. At around the time that he was working, many engineers were staging an anti-mathematics movement. His response to this anti-mathematics movement was to join this society as a mathematician. He joined this society as a mathematician. He worked and solicited collaborations with school teachers. And you can see in this quote from the 19, a translation of the 1908, that uh, he was arguing that calculating machines should have a place in the classroom. And so his example from more than 100 years ago is an example, it's an existence proof that educational programs and systems can improve when we can listen, learn, and include, and draw in perspectives that we might not otherwise have an affinity for. And that might, even be in a time of conflict. But he was able to do this because he forged those alliances even in this time of conflict. All right, so for my second example, we're gonna take a time machine and a travel machine. I guess a time machine can do both. 
uh, and, go to the, and go to the US in 1990s to 2000s. To set the stage for this, I actually want to do a little bit of mathematics, which is to consider these following problems. All right, so these are problems that if you haven't seen before, you've seen something like them, here are the answers. But the point is this, here's a contrast. What if instead of the problems that you just saw, they were situated like this? Why does negative one times negative one equal one? And why is it that we call x a variable in equations like 6x plus 5 equals 10 when it just stands for one number? How is that varying? So now we're going to flip from a math lens to a teaching practice lens. What are different explanations or metaphors that you could use to help a student make sense of why negative 1 times 1 equals 1? And how would you respond to the student? Because sometimes work of teaching is, about, is not just about the mathematics. Actually, all the time it's not just about the mathematics, but it's about also what happens when you respond to the student and how you elicit their ideas. And sometimes teaching also means making mathematics visible to students and setting up some sort of cycle of mathematical discovery, knowing what to push and knowing what to show on the horizon. So this notion of mathematical, mathematical knowledge through teaching uh, was, first, was first, well, it was first introduced in the late 1980s, but really developed in the 1990s and 2000s through various scholars like Deborah Ball and Hyman Bass, Lee Shulman, uh, Pat, uh, Patrick Thompson. And this idea happened during a period of conflict. So in the late 1950s, there was Sputnik, and this launched new math, and then a backlash to new math was back to basics, and then there was a backlash to that, which led to popularizing something that you might now know as active learning or something like it, and then there was a backlash to that. And this backlash was particularly vitriolic, and it's now been known as something, an event called the Math Wars. It was not fashionable in the math wars to listen, to learn, to include. And I'm gonna say more about that, but what I wanna point out is that this was a big time, this was a huge time of conflict and there were costs and casualties to this kind of violent rhetoric that was happening in this time. I interviewed, I spent the last year interviewing some professionals who have lived through the math wars and I want to share with you some of their thoughts on what are the costs and casualties of math wars. Kay said, if anything, the term war is too polite. No one was killing each other literally or going to the hospital, but people were vicious and elitist and they weren't willing to listen. I think that if people had been able to work together, we might be able to have to work together to counteract institutional obstacles. Ruth said, that's one of the big costs honest communication. And so I asked her, what would you name as the casualties of the math wars? And she said, the mathematics curriculum, the proper functioning. It's like being in a divorce. You have these people that are fighting, and suddenly you don't have a sense of security of what you're learning or who to trust. Where are the adults in the room? And Victor said, they should have invited comments or participation but instead they wanted domination. Both sides say, I want this, but neither knows exactly what this is. So why don't we come together, lay out the whole curriculum in detail? But no one was that good. So I asked, if the costs could have been avoided or recouped, what could have been gained? And Victor said, maybe the students could have avoided the last 20 years. So what these professionals who lived through this vitriolic moment in math education history were saying is that the cost is nothing less than quality mathematics education. Because without perspectives of mathematicians, mathematical scientists, and math educators, we cannot have a functioning math education system. Now in this era, luckily, there were people who worked to build bridges. And I wanna call out especially people like Deborah Ball and Hyman Bass, who worked together and also rallied together 
other mathematicians and math education researchers and psychometricians and all of these different stakeholders for intellectual work. In this case, the work was intellectual work for the mathematical knowledge of teaching. And it's, one ex it's an existence proof now in the 1990s to 2000s that we can, as a community, listen, learn, and include, even in times of conflict. All right, but that was the past, right? <laughs> My kids weren't even born yet. Um, so let's take a look at a, a modern example, worldwide, 2000s to now. There was a whole bunch of empirical evidence, a whole bunch of studies that showed that the, the, double discontinuity, the double discontinuity, as named by Klein in 1908, was alive and well. Multiple studies documented that high school teachers, whether they were prospective or practicing, were asking the question, why, how does university math experience have anything to do with what I have to do every day as a teacher? Now, you might think, of course university math has something to do with high school. Abstract algebra and mathematical modeling might, uh, abstract algebra or mathematical modeling, shouldn't those underlie how we make sense of the world and the operation, number in operation? Maybe, um, but it also depends on how it's taught and how it's received and how it's experienced. And so there has been contemporary work to mend discontinuity from many different people, and all of what these groups have in common is that they looked for opportunities to, uh, to find continuities between school mathematical practice, university mathematical practice, school pedagogical practice, and university pedagogical practice. And not only that, but also how do we support the math faculty who might be teaching courses where there are teachers to enact all of these different continuities. The group that I'm part of, the modules, um, it was only possible because we were able to gather together expertise across teacher learning, K-12, teaching, mathematics, mathematics education research. And so in other words, contemporary work to mend this double discontinuity is another existence proof that we can build bridges and we need to build bridges because it's about research and practice that's shaped by all of the different disciplines that go into it. The work of teaching, the work of mathematics, its practice, how it's experienced. So the claim one that I'm going to make based on these three examples that span more than a century now is that we build bridges because it is who we are as a community and it is who we need to be as a community because it shapes the kinds of questions that we can see. We wouldn't be able to ask some of the questions until we talk to other people to see how their perspectives differ and to see where it is that the perspectives might even align or at least the questions that we're most interested in. And not only does it help us see questions differently and ask different questions, but it might also shape the types of approaches that we can see. How many times have you been in an argument or a discussion with somebody where you were able to come up with a solution that was different from what either of you came in thinking was the ideal. And that is the, kind, that is the sort of product that we need more and more of, especially in this time, for the education of, the ch of children, of undergraduates, of doctoral students, and just how math is perceived. Second claim. We need to build bridges for the vitality of the math community. And by this, I also mean within and across math departments. X belongs in the mathematics community. What is X? Geometry and topology, partial differential equations, optimization methods, mathematical modeling, combinatorics. I think we would all agree that these belong. And maybe we can even define belonging as saying that it serves the teaching, search, or service mission of a math department. And in that case, my proposition is that one solution for X is math education, and that's by definition. Proposition. Mathematics education belongs in the math community. Uh, in the spirit of inquiry, let's give another proof. 
by existence. All right, raise your hand if you recognize this number or you know of a number like it. <laughs> All right, so this, these are example codes from the uh, MSC 2020, which is the current system uh, for the math subject classification system. So here's a question for you. How popular is math education, MSC 97, as a self-identified primary interest area among AMS members in the US? And you can look this up, by the way, in the AMS member directory. You can choose what your primary interest area is. All right, here's a graph by, uh, it's all the MSC codes that are active. There's 60 something of them. And then the vertical shows you how many AMS members in the US self-identified that MSC code as their primary area of interest. All right, so. Where do you think 97, which is math education, is? Here it is. Number 19 out of 63. Top third. Okay, so math education is nestled between topological and Lie groups and commutative algebra. It is more popular than operator theory and also fluid mechanics. All right, here's another, exist here's, another, here's another way to slice that problem. How many math departments identify math education as a research area? All right, so if you look at the AMS website, you can find a listing of North American member institutions of the AMS. And they have all of these categories. There's about 500 or 600 of them. Let's just look at the ones from, that are called university. So university at, university of, I'm at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, you may be at a university at or of something. Okay, how many of these departments do you think list math education as a research area of their department on their webpage? More than 40%. So that's my existence proof. Math education belongs in the math community because it's already there. So you might think, well, there's so many math educators and math departments. There's so many math departments that list math education as a research area. This must mean that the climate for math educators who work in math departments is fantastic. That's the case for some people. So in the last year or so, as part of the Sigma MKT uh, Special Interest Group of the MAA on Mathematical Knowledge for Teaching, and also as an initiative of the MAA's Committee on the Mathematical Education of Teachers, we've been conducting a virtual listening tour of math educators from around the country. Many of those worked in math departments. And we asked them, how supported do you feel by your department? And, how's, and how valued do you feel your work is by your department? Now, some people, uh, some of these math educators said that their department valued their work and that they felt like their tenure cases were smooth, no surprises. But from among the 30 or 40 institutions of, of math educators that we've talked to, there were also too many instances of fragile and fractious climates. And what we mean by fragile and fractious is this. Fragile is that they thought that they were supported and they did feel valued, but then they realized that it was only one person. And then that person might have left. It was fragile because they had a fragile support system and a fragile culture. And fractious means contentious. And when I say this, I mean contentious tenure cases, contentious promotion cases, faculty meetings where the department decided that in teaching evaluations, they were not allowed to cite math education scholarship or research. And I bring this up because of my third proof of mathematics education belongs in the mathematical community. And this is by necessity. The future of our community depends on addressing a number of important and existential problems. There are lots of these problems. 
but I'm going to highlight a couple of them. Inequity in, in mathematical opportunities. Teacher education and retention at scale. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you could think of the teacher workforce as being equivalent approximately in number to the number of IT workers. We need teachers. We need to be able to prepare teachers at scale, and we need to find a way to keep teachers in the profession and also to give them, and also to be able to provide a supportive environment for those prospective teachers, whether they're at early childhood or elementary or middle or secondary, community college and beyond. We need to find a supportive environment for them so that they can go out feeling like they are a part of the mathematical community. Cultivating supportive environments also for doctoral students, particularly those who are underrepresented, or designing mathematical pathways that work across systems. I call these existential problems because they go at the very existence of the mathematical community. We do not have a future if we do not have children and students who actually identify as part of the mathematical community, and it is up to us as a mathematical community to nurture that future. Addressing these kinds of problems is going to take earnest listening and learning to understand what those problems even mean and what are the key issues to work on. And we need bridges across mathematics and education research and a number of other areas to make practice, to make progress on these kinds of problems. So we need to build bridges for the health of our departments and also for the vitality and future of the mathematical community. That's why to build bridges, but how to build bridges. And I would say that to build bridges, we need openness to methods, experiences, and expertise, and openness to the possibility that we can be allies. I'd like you to consider three phrases now. Here's the first one. The plural of anecdote is not data. Have you heard that before? And what I want to do is to question this idea. There's a time and place for this, there's a time and place for this kind of sentiment that just because you have an experience that it should generalize, right? We know, I'm sure that we can all think of examples in the medical field or maybe in our own experience, that it is possible to overgeneralize from one story. But that doesn't mean that stories are not important. And so we do need to be open to methods that highlight lived experiences alongside other methods so that we can improve, for instance, access to high quality mathematical opportunities. And so I think about a study such as the one that was led by Michael Young and Sarah Sword uh, and Carl Westing uh, and Tara Jordan on studying successful doctoral students who are underrepresented. And they interviewed 75 students at various stages. And it was because of those kinds of interviews that they were able to say something about the importance of belonging and also the sorts of slights, macro and micro, that these students experienced. Maybe that was 75 anecdotes. It was data. It was data that can inform how we as a mathematical community can serve and nurture our students, especially those who are underrepresented because they're first generation, because they're black, because they're Latin, because they're indigenous. For whatever other status, we need to have stories to understand how to nurture. And don't just take it from me. Uh, if you look at the National Academy's report on advancing anti-racism uh, in, uh, in higher education, they, one of their conclusions, 4.1, is that we need to be open to ethnographic methods that elicit the stories of where people are coming from and what their experiences have been. So there may be some anecdotes that don't add up to data, but there are some stories that are data and data that we all desperately need to hear. 
Phrase number two. Mathematics is gatekeeping. So mathematics as a community has a history of gatekeeping. If you look at the AMS task force report uh, on racial discrimination, you can see a lot of that history. And we need, to, we need to do better than that. But if we say, if we use phrases like mathematics is gatekeeping, then that is reifying an idea that limits the kind of possibilities that we can see. We need to be open to the idea that in perhaps in history and even maybe in the, and, and not even maybe, and in the current day, there are instances where as a community, we have engaged in gatekeeping. We have kept people out, but we can also do better than that. Mathematics doesn't need to be gatekeeping. We can make mathematics a gateway, but it requires us to build bridges, to learn, to listen, to include, to understand and solicit stories. We need to be open to the possibility of change so that as a community, we can do better. Finally, phrase number three, which is two phrases, mathematician and mathematics educator. We need to be open to the possibility that mathematicians and mathematics educators and also mathematics and mathematics education can be allies. So often when we use these words, we use them to divide. We can use them in phrases like them, they're not a mathematician. Them, they're not a math educator. It's a way of staking territory. It's a way to say they're not us. But what if instead we considered these terms as terms of honor and expertise? To say, that person is a mathematician, and I call them a mathematician because I'm recognizing the kind of expertise that they can bring to bear on their work, on problems that we're facing as a community. Or we use a word like math educator to honor their expertise and experiences of understanding the nature of teaching and learning, of understanding students, of working with students. And to use that term to include and to bring in, when will we use these terms not to divide, but to honor and include? Why build bridges? How to build bridges. We build bridges because it's who we are and who we need to be as a community. If we're going to make progress on pressing problems, we need to not just be able to say the problems in this vague cloud of something that we need to address, something that we need to fix, something that we need to do better with, but we also need to be able to ask and sharpen the kinds of questions and lens that we take. If you think about the problem of mathematical knowledge for teaching. At the time, there were so many studies that were blaming, I mean, that could be cast as blaming teachers, that, oh, well, if teachers only knew more, then students would do better. And then, there, and then it's like, well, maybe if people were able to train teachers better, then the teachers would do better, and then, I mean, there was all of this blame game going on. But instead, if we, turn, if, we turn this question, if we turn the problem on its head and we instead think about, well, okay, so let's say we do have the opportunity to teach teachers mathematics and provide them with mathematical opportunity and experience so that they can shine and learn, what kind of mathematics would be crucial? Is it abstract algebra? Is it ring theory? Is it mathematical modeling? Is it statistical inference? What is it really? But even those terms, algebra, geometry, are so broad. And I think back to that quote of Victor. They could have invited participations and comments, but they wanted domination. Everybody, want, everybody said, I want this, but nobody knew what this was. 
Why didn't we just all get together and figure out what we meant? For me, mathematical knowledge for teaching, which is the area that I've been working in for the past decade, is an example of what happens when you can have the grace and curiosity and strength to bring in multiple perspectives. And so instead of asking why aren't, you know, why isn't the system better? Or why, why aren't our math courses good enough? I mean, surely algebra has to do with number and operation. Surely hyperbolic geometry has to do with teaching proofs at the secondary level. And instead of taking these assumptions as given, to instead lay out these assumptions and say, you, a math educator, who, and I use that term as an honor, or you as a mathematician, using that term with honor and inclusion. Let's think about these ideas together. And from that, maybe we can give birth to a question instead like, what is the mathematical knowledge entailed in the recurrent work of teaching? And that was a central question, as posed by Deborah Ball and Hyman Bass and Mark Thames and colleagues, that pushed the field forward because we were then able to see that it wasn't just about math, and it wasn't just about teaching, but about the recurrent work of teaching. What is it that teachers actually do? How is it that mathematics could actually have anything to do with that? And then once you get into that, you can then specify, OK, let's say that teachers do have to teach number and operation, or geometry, or, or functions. What is it about functions that comes up in teaching? What is it about functions that comes up vertically across the curriculum, but also in each time slice as you're working with the student in that moment. In that question, what is the mathematical knowledge entailed in the recurrent work of teaching, to me is this example of the kind of question that only could have been asked because of this bridging of perspectives. Klein's work 100, more than 100 years ago, when he joined the Society of Engineers, when he bridged alliances between school teachers and engineers and mathematicians to come up with what, is the, what should the curriculum look like. That's another example of being able to ask the question differently. Right? It wasn't about we need to know more math or we need to know more math or less math or we need to have anti-math. But instead it was like, OK, so if functions are important, what about functions is important? Let's get into the details. Let's, like, let's dig deep into that so that in that earth, we can, we can reap the intellectual product that we actually need to move forward to educate children and teachers. Finding ways to listen, learn, and include is vital to the functioning of math departments and also to the future of the mathematical community. And I call on all of us here to, to build those bridges so, like, so for the vitality of our community. Thank you. All right, so we have some time for uh, question and answers, and I would like to make a request that if you have a question that you use one of the how many micro, there's two microphones over here uh, for the purposes of recording. But before any questions get asked, um, in the spirit of building bridges and forming alliances, I'd like, to, I'd like to give you the chance to talk to some people around you. Maybe try to find somebody that's from a different perspective than you to see what thoughts and questions come to mind for you.
I'll give you five more minutes. All right, at this time, I'd like to well, thank you for engaging in conversation. All right, so we still have about 10, uh, 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, so if there's a, so could you raise your hand if you have a question that you'd like to ask? Okay, I'm gonna wait for more hands. I see one hand, two hands, three hands. I'll wait until there's five hands. All right, four. All right, anybody else have a question that they'd like to ask? All right, let's start over there. Um, and then can you, uh, can you just introduce yourself before asking your question? 
All right. Um, my name is Francesca Gandini, currently at St. Olaf College, but I want to say a few words about my graduate experience at the University of Michigan. Um, at the University of Michigan, the math department and the School of Education are divided by one street. So literally just Church Street, you go across. And one of the best formative experience I had uh, was to actually take a class in uh, uh, mathematical, in, in research in mathematical education with Deborah Bo. And that was like one of the best things that I had as, as, as in my career, right? And then I was so excited about it and then started to, to, say, to say that to some folks. You know, you talk about the scene, but not the senior. And in the math department, and I didn't even know the name Deborah Ball. Le Alon said, no, it was one of the leading scholars in education, and it was across the street. Um, and so, you know, as a scientist, I want to approach this with curiosity. And uh, I want to ask, you know, how does it happen that there is such a there's such a divide in universities where the, you know, the math lives in what building, whatever people, I'm just gonna say math because people label it as math and the, math educa and the education, which math is a subfield, math education, lives in, our, in like another building so much that if they're across the street, they still, they don't even know the existence of each other. And I mean, I don't expect you to have an answer, but if you have some like historical like perspectives on how this happened, because to me, it's still baffling, you know, very baffling. So, thank you. Thank you. So um, if I can summarize, so uh, first of all, I should, uh, should disclose that I spent six happy years at the University of Michigan. Uh, first in the math department as a um, as an RTG postdoc there working with uh, Dick Canary and the Geometry and Topology group, and then another three years at the School of Education in Deborah Ball and Hyman Bass's group. Um, so I, I just wanna put that out there, so I'm very familiar with Church Street. Crossed it many times. <laughs> um, I, you know, I guess the first thought that comes to mind is that there are, there's too many silos in all of academia. Right, I mean, do you, we teach a lot of engineering. If you're in a math, how many of you are in a math department? Okay, so you've probably taught engineers. You've probably taught med, pre-med students. Do you know the pre-med faculty? Do you know the engineers? I mean, maybe you know one or two, but you might not, you don't know the department. And so I think this idea, I, I mean, I think that there's maybe particularly problematic is the separation between math and math education, but I also think it's endemic to how, as a community, we've unfortunately siloed ourselves. I'm Abby Herzig, and um, I don't know how to define my affiliation, but um, so I've taught teachers, I've taught math courses for teachers, I've taught math content for teachers, and I, then I've taught some methods courses. And one of the things that I think is the biggest obstacle to those bridges is mathematicians, that is people who are faculty in a math department who say, we need to teach abstract algebra and geometry and all these other things because we cannot give college credit for a course that spends a month diving deeply into what ratio and proportion means. That's just not college level material. And I'm wondering if you have a thought on what that communication can be to, you know, what is that bridge? Right, so thank you, Abby. Um, so, Something that comes to mind is a recent result by, uh, by Taylor McNeil at Vanderbilt, and they were looking at how math departments used the term rigor. And the argument that they came to upon interviewing and observing math department faculty meetings was that rigor might initially mean something about being able to justify, being able to reason, being able to write complete explanations, proofs of particular propositions or theorems or lemmas. 
It might also mean being able to ask sophisticated questions, whatever sophisticated means. But then after that, there's this slide where rigor begins in this lofty place that I think we would all want all of our students to be able to cultivate. And it starts from this lofty place and slides into, if we're not failing enough people, it must not be rigorous. If we're passing too many people, if we're giving too many A's. And I bring that up because I think it has to do with this college credit idea, that there's this notion of college credit should only be given for sufficiently rigorous courses, but what does it mean to be sufficiently rigorous? And maybe it means being able to prove something about properties of rings or groups um, or fields, uh, but there's also a sense that there's a rigor to explanations that teachers have to give every day about fractions or, what it, or how to place a number precisely on the number line um, or what exactly is the inverse of a function. And I guess I think that there's a lot of work to be done there as a mathematical community to see where the rigor and precision is in there and why that kind of particular rigor and precision for teaching practice is so important. Um, and I also think that one way to begin to build bridges um, is to showcase examples of this, um, is to say, well, if you, were, if you were going to explain to a student why is, what is the inverse of a function, what exactly does, you know, a, what exactly does it mean to be three-fourths or three-fifths? Um, and to get into those details, that's, I think that's where the bridge building happens. But I also don't want to be sanguine and say that, oh, as soon as you pose this kind of problem, it's going to solve everything. But it's a process and it's, a, it's, it's an ongoing conversation of, you know, can we, can we find some examples that we can drill down into together to appreciate the kind of rigor and precision that goes into mathematics teaching and why it's important in these courses that where we teach primarily pre-service uh, prospective elementary or middle or secondary teachers, that they're not just learning rigor and precision in terms of axioms of geometry, but also in terms of what it means to be a fraction, what it means to place something on a number line, and what it means to be a function. First, thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, Curtis Bennett, Cal State Long Beach, um, Dean. So I'm looking at things from a slightly different perspective nowadays. But um, as you talk about the math wars, I think, as you're probably well aware, I think we're facing math wars too in California. And I was wondering if you had suggestions and advice about how to frame things on both sides to try to lower the tensions for this California math framework extension. It's already been raised to pretty high temperatures. So, thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Um, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if people from self-identified opposing perspectives could be invited to a forum to discuss why it is that they, where it is that they come from, what their perspectives are, and also what would be suitable rules of engagement because I think what happens, what, I think part of what happened in the math wars in the 1990s and to 2000s, and maybe what's happening right now in California, is there's this tendency to, to create straw people. It's like, oh, well, maybe data science, if we introduce data science, then all we're doing is having students press buttons and look at pretty pictures. And on the other hand, the straw person for taking a legacy approach like Algebra 2 is, well, isn't that what has not been working? Isn't that just procedures? And there may be, you know, of course, any curriculum can slide into something that it wasn't intended to, but the focus of the conversation, I mean, wouldn't it be great if the focus of the conversation could be, all right, so what is the merit of understanding the world around us in a data-driven way, and what, what is the role of proof and justification alongside statistical reasoning and alongside mathematical modeling? 
Um, I want to give a shout out to Donna Lund and Brendan Kelly. Uh, so I can now put on my CV that uh, I'm a mathematician who convinced somebody who believes in quantitative literacy and a statistician that proofs might have a place in the math curriculum. And also on my CV is I'm a mathematician who is convinced by somebody who believes in quantitative literacy and who, and who is a statistician that statistical reasoning and quantitative literacy, computational thinking and math modeling have a place in the curriculum. And one way that we were able to come to that common understanding was first through a lot of disagreement and a lot of questioning, but also getting down into the details of what we meant by each of these things and what their value is to math education. Uh, Matt Park, Virginia Tech. Um, and so I wanted to talk about this kind of divide between uh, mathematicians and math educators in just some department, given that the math faculty um, do teach, and it's not too far-fetched to think that they have their own mathematical knowledge for teaching for whatever class they do. Um, and so how can um, uh, the math educators validate their own, their colleagues' personal theories of MKT and of mathematical teaching and learning while asserting their own authority as maybe capital M-E math education researchers. Thanks, Matt. So if I understand your question, you're saying that people uh, that perhaps self-identify as mathematicians may be thinking about learning and teaching and issues of education from a different perspective than those who come, uh, who might self-identify instead as a math education researcher first or a math educator first. Um, and how is it that these two communities can actually come into conversation and honor each other's expertise? I mean, I think it's, I think that part of it is just being you know, inviting somebody to the same room as you. And I mean that literally, as in you should be next to each other and actually talking with each other. Um, and, you know, saying, you know, if, if there's a problem or if there's some sort of issue that you're both working on, how do we drill down into the details to understand? So it's not just, it's not about who's correct or incorrect, even if that's the case. Uh, but I would say that it, with anything that has to do fundamentally with social relations, uh, correct and incorrect isn't the correct, I mean, that's a binary frame isn't what you wanna do when it comes to social and emotional relations. Um, but I would say instead the point, it's not to dominate, right? But it's to invite comments and participation and to learn together. So even if you walk away from that conversation still having two different perspectives and maybe even having learned something different from that conversation, the important thing is to actually have the conversation and to learn from each other. Oh, I think there's dueling microphones. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Lizia. Uh, uh, hi, Yvonne. Thanks very much uh, from the National Science Foundation. I thought when you brought up rigor that you were going to go down. There's a joke in there about rigor mortis, but um, <laughs> I, uh, just, this a, uh, just a quick observation. I ran into a colleague uh, from the American uh, Physics Society um, a year or so ago, and uh, they had done an interesting study, and I got me thinking about whether this would be useful for the math world. Um, they looked at um, uh, departments that had physics education research programs, PER, and um, they had very strong evidence that enrollments and majors, physics majors, were much higher in those departments that had PER programs. So it seems to me that, I mean, that's an interesting political sort of observation that you could use with colleagues, so I, 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 you don't have this answer, but I'm wondering if this, this audience might be, we should be thinking about that. So. Thank you so much. 
Um, I think that's a great place to end. Uh, I think it is at this point nearly 12.05. So I would like to invite you to Moscone 204, which is right next door, um, to chat for a little bit more if you would like to. Thank you again.